I want to turn to page uh, 148, 148. Page 148. Well, today we'll uh, start an exciting new chapter in our studies, IV anesthetics. Um, last Friday, our last class, we I wrapped it up by playing you Dr. Egger's video or PowerPoint. I think there was some benefit too. Um, but anyways, it's time to move on. So our next topic will be the IV anesthetics, of course, a very important part of uh, anesthesia practice. This is chapter nine in the textbook, chapter nine. So so far we've covered chapter eight, which is the gas anesthetics. And now we'll be covering chapter nine, which is the IV anesthetics. And as you can see on page 148, it's kind of a cute place to start by listing what would be an ideal, wonderful IV anesthetic if we had one, we don't. But this is what we would like it to do, uh, be stable in aqueous solution, uh, no pain in injection or uh, venous damage, tissue damage, etc. No histamine release, allergic reactions, rapidly metabolized to inactive non toxic substances, rapid and smooth on, uh, action, uh, steep dose response curve so you can change those just little doses, give you big changes, uh, rapid and smooth return to consciousness even after you've been giving it for a long time. So fast in, fast out, obviously. Uh, decreased cerebral metabolism, proportional to the decrease in cerebral blood flow. Minimum cardiac and respiratory effects. And a rapid recovery without any side effects. That's a pretty good drug. Too bad we don't have one. Okay, as always, on the next page, 149, let's start our discussion of this next group of drugs by talking about the names of the drugs. So these are the ones we're going to cover. Uh, starting with uh, top benzodiazepines um, and there's three of them of interest to us primarily because they're the ones that are available IV and um, even though we don't use Valium or Ativan that much uh, anymore, they're still around. We'll talk about them a little bit. So diazepam is Valium, of course, and lorazepam is Ativan. Uh, midazolam is a 99.99999 percent of anesthesia practice. So that's what we use, and we give it to almost everybody that first set, of course. And then there's a reversal agent for all benzodiazepines, Fomazinil, the trade name is Fomazicon. There's one uh, butyrophenone tranquilizer, and uh, that's Troperidol. Uh, the trade name is Anapsine, we'll talk about that. And then these uh, following drugs are just miscellaneous. They're not part of a group of drugs, they're just single entity drugs that have uh, big time use for us. Of course, the grand data of them all is Propofol. The trade name is Diprovan, and there's several generic um, brands out there. That's an important point, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, etomidate, which is uh, amidate. Uh, ketamine, which is Ketalar, is the trade name, although everybody calls it ketamine. And then finally, uh, dexmedetomidine, which is Presidex. And finally, uh, on a historical basis, I'll cover all for a couple of minutes. We'll talk a little bit about the barbs, uh, because, of course, Penafol was the granddaddy of them all. Um, Methoxetol or Revitol is still floating around the United States here or there. Uh, they don't really market it anymore, but there are some com compounding pharmacies, that is local pharmacies that will make you drugs for you, that are still making it. 
some people like to use it for cardio versions and a couple other things. So it, I'll talk a little bit about them, uh, but basically we're not going to worry about it too much. Um, on the next page, uh, 150, there's the barbiturate drugs, uh, Penethol and, and so on. And you can see there's just a few left on the market. Uh, and so let me give you a little background. <coughs> Don't write. Just listen. Back in the 19, I want to say 30s, I might be wrong. Um, the anesthesiologist uh, decided to use Penethol to uh, begin anesthesia prior to that. Of course, we used open drop ether. You've saw, seen movies of that. And it was a really revolutionary thing to begin anesthesia induction by giving IV push bolus of drugs. So you give one dose, large sleep dose, we call it, or anesthetic dose um, of a drug, IV, to start the anesthetic and then hurry up and turn on the gas and so on. And you can see we still practice that way now. So it hasn't changed. What's changed is we don't use penicillin anymore, we use propofol and, and amidate and, and so on. So anyways, uh, that came around in you know, the 1930s, early 40s. Um, 1950s, the uh, number one sedative hypnotic agents in pharmacology, hypnotic means sleeping pills, so sedative hypnotic drugs, were these barbs, and there was about 25 of them, different ones on the market. Um, <clears throat> and they were widely used, but they got a lot of problems. They have a, a tremendous number of side effects. And uh, one of, probably the biggest one being addiction. So uh, people would take them as sleeping pills and become dependent on them. The withdrawal can be you know, life-threatening. You know, have seizures and die. That wasn't good. Plus, they, uh, they didn't uh, produce desirable type of sedation. In the pharmacy world, what the pharmacists call um, drugs that produce anti-anxiety drugs and so on, they say that they uh, were using them for daytime sedation. That's a loaded term in the foreign drug world. Daytime sedation means you don't want the patient to be sedated because it's daytime and they have to get up and go to work and drive a car and take care of their kids and you know say hello to their husband or wife or whatever. So daytime sedation is kind of a, one of those oxymorons in the sense that, well, yes, you're taking a sedative drug, but you don't want to, want to be sedated. You just want an anti-anxiety effect. So when the benzodiazepines came out in the late 1960s, they introduced Librium and Valium. They quickly were able to switch to them because they produce excellent daytime sedation. What happens is, you take Valium, you'll be sedate for three or four days, then you become tolerant to the sedative effect. But you never develop tolerance for the anti-anxiety effect. So the, you get the effect you want, and then you're not walking around drowsy and, and drugged up all the time. And then today, all the way up till today, and we're going to talk about the benzodiazepines, they're the number one drugs for anti-anxiety. Um, prescriptions, and there's about 20 of them still on the market. We'll cover those in a couple days. Anyways, since the benzodiazepines were extremely safe, very little addiction properties, they have some, but uh, they weren't causing uh, overdoses and uh, all the problems that people are having with the barbiturate drugs, that they just replaced them. So there's only a few of these left, if you look on page 130, uh, pentothal, thiopentol, uh, phenobarbital, which of course is still around, and it's used quite widely as an anti-seizure uh, drug. So people take uh, phenobarbital, so that's still around. Uh, pentobarbital, which is nembutal, is still used occasionally for drug comas in uh, traumatic brain injury patients and some other select uses, uh, cecobarbital or secanol, and then methohexital, which is brevitol. So there's still uh, five of them on the market. They're almost the only one that really used to any great extent anymore is phenobarbital. Um, again, because, I mean, they're very potent. 
they also have a lot of, a lot of adverse effects. And we've been able to replace them with much safer drugs nowadays. So we'll talk about these in a little while, but not now. So the next uh, thing is on page 151. And so let's start with that. <coughs> well, Pentothal was around till I want to say the early 2000s. And it's, it's an odd story, but what happened was uh, we, we, the anesthesia community, had pretty much stopped using it anyways because propofol is so much better in induction drug, so much shorter acting, and you'll see as we get through class today, you'll have a much greater feel for why we like propofol much better than pentothal. But we used pentothal for at least a half a decade, and it was the number one drug to put people to sleep. Oddly, what killed it was several groups, anti-death penalty groups, uh, sued various states because they were using pentothal <coughs> for executions for the death penalty. And they said it was cruel and unusual punishment. And they got several courts to agree with them. And then the companies that were making it said, well, there's too much of a risk of a lawsuit. They were going to sue the companies that were supplying it and they're not making any money on it, nobody uses it anyways, so the people just stop distributing it. So I don't think you can even buy Pentothal in the United States anymore, just because it got kind of knocked off by the death penalty, uh, which was kind of silly because there's 7,000 7, other sedative drugs they could use as well, but they were trying to use it as an example and so on. So that's the, the end of Pentothal and Brevitol. Like I said, although we've stopped using it many, many years before that, uh, to any great extent. So now we have propofol and we're happy with it. It's got some downsides, we'll talk about them today. So on page 151, what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, wind her back and forth a little bit. We're going to look at this kinetic state. So this is a, a select uh, kinetic values for the IV induction aids. And this kind of kinetic table will be for every group of drugs we talk about for now on. The opiates, the local anesthetics, the uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs, and all the cardiac drugs, and so on. And they always report the same kind of values. And so you want to get a feel for why are they telling me this, and what, is, what does the number mean, and does it really matter? Do I have to pay attention? So for that, I want to go over some of these terms. And uh, so let's start. I'm on page 151. So there's Valium, Diazepam, Lorazepam, Azadavan, Mendazolam, Versed, Etomidate, Propofol, Ketamine, and Presidex. And they're comparing the various uh, uh, kinetic values. So let's look at half-life first. And let's talk about half-life. What does half-life mean in pharmacology? Many people have erroneous ideas about what it means, and so I don't want you to have them. So let's do this. Let's go, number one, first of all, to page 154. Page 154. It's a simple concept, but it's used quite often the wrong way. And now that you're learning this, you will never use it the wrong way. I'll, I'm just taking this figure. I happen to have it right here, just as an example. But uh, by definition, and I have it all written down for you, so don't worry about writing. Just listen. Uh, the half-life, everybody agrees, the kinetics folks, that first of all, everything when you talk about a drug in the body, it all relates to blood level. All right? What we really care about is what's at the receptor level. But since we can't measure that readily, at a micro level at the receptor, we can very easily measure blood level by just taking a blood sample and analyzing it. So everything is related to blood level. And half-life of drug is by definition the time it takes for the blood level to drop by one half. That was, that was easy, wasn't it? time it takes for the drug level 
to drop by one half. There's a lot of nuances to that, so let me show you. This top figure here, this is propofol, two milligrams per kilo. It's a computer simulation. I'm on page 154. And, well, let's read what the guy says. The simulated time course of whole blood levels of propofol after induction with two milligrams per kilo. So this is something you're going to do every day at work. Go in, put some to sleep, two milligrams per kilo of propofol. This is what you're, you're doing inside the body, all right? So at time zero here, this is the plasma concentration in mics per ml. So you inject your... Let's say 70 kilo patient, you're going to give 2 milligrams per kilo. That's 140 milligrams of propofol, right? 2 times 70. It's 10 milligrams per cc. So you're going to give 14 cc's or mls of propofol. Standard routine, simple stuff. So yeah, I give an IV push of 14 mls. This is what the blood level looks like. You're starting, you're pushing that 14 mLs all IV, and you're going to end up with some peak amount in the blood once you stop get to the 14th mL. Right, so blood level obviously goes up very quickly to its peak level, which will be proportionate to how much you gave. And it's simple stuff. Then immediately, the drug starts to distribute from the blood into the tissues. So the blood level will fall very rapidly. And this initial rapid deep drop in blood level occurs because the drug is leaving the blood and going off into the tissues. Right, is everybody with me on that? And then the time it takes for this to happen, the half-life of this is referred to in pharmacology as the alpha half-life. You see them talking about the alpha half-life of the drug. What they're talking about is the distribution half-life. Very important. Distribution half-life. How long is it going to take this drug to distribute from the blood, now that I've given an IV, into the body? And it's usually uh, measured in minutes. It just takes them several, you know, minutes. The more lipid soluble the drug is, the faster it distributes. The shorter the alpha half-life. All right, well, and we'll get into all this in a minute. Remember when Dr. Ager was talking about giving narcotics, and he said, "Oh, you want to give somebody fentanyl because its peak effect is in seven minutes." Don't use morphine because it takes 45 minutes to peak. All right. What, in pharmacology terms, what he was saying is the alpha half-life of morphine is too long. It takes too long to distribute into the where you want it to go, the CNS. Therefore, you try fentanyl because it has a much faster dis distribution. All right. So you can... Draw a straight line through this curve, initial drop in the blood level, all the way to zero. You can solve a straight line and come up with a, a number. And then how long did it take to go, let's pretend this is eight, well, I'll just round it off. How long did it take to go from eight to four? That's one half-life. How long did it take to go from four to two? That's another half-life. How long did it take to go from two to one? That's another half-life. Half. You just keep half in the blood level, dividing it by two. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. All right. So that's called the alpha half-life. It's the distribution half-life. And it's not that important. We don't really care it clinically. We know our drugs are so lipid-soluble that they're going to distribute pretty quickly. So, you know, the alpha half-life is fine to talk in class. But clinically, it doesn't really give you much information. However, once the drug, drug dis evenly distributes out into the body, then the blood level starts to fall much slower. You see this curve here? The curve kind of flattens out, and the blood 
level keeps dropping, but it doesn't drop as fast <coughs> as it was when you were distributing. Right? And you can extrapolate this line here back to the time zero and calculate the math of it all. And you can figure out a half-life there. And that's called the beta half-life. So there's two half-lives. The beta half-life is once the drug is distributed and now it's being metabolized, that's the reason the blood level is falling. So look at my pen. This drop here, blood level drop, was because of drug distribution. This blood level drop is because of drug metabolism. In the metabolic half-life, we refer to as the elimination half-life. That's how long it takes the drug to be eliminated at, due to metabolism and excretion and so on. And that's referred to the beta, as called the beta half-life. All right, so let me summarize it all. Don't write, just watch. You give a drug IV, in fact, in many ki kinetic figures that you see in a book, they don't even draw this line going up to the peak. Because you're giving an IV, you know it's going up. And that's no mystery. They just they keep it off of there. So they just start up here. The f initial rapid drop in blood, blood level is because of distribution. That's referred to as the alpha half-life. Distribution half-life. Then there'll be a little knee in the curve. And the slower drop in blood level that occurs is called the elimination half-life. That's occurring because the drug's being eliminated from the body, and that's called the beta half-life. Everybody see that? <coughs> All right, now, let's go back to our table a couple of pages earlier. And page 151. Look at the first column. The distribution half-life in minutes. So every kinetic table we read for the rest of the time you have me in class, both this semester and next, next semester, you'll see, that no matter who wrote it, they'll have a column that says distribution half-life. And it's usually in minutes. It could also be re also referred to as the alpha half-life. So look at propofol, for example. It's our prototypical induction drug. The distribution half-life is two to four minutes. But we'll pick two. So you give somebody, slug them with that two milligrams per kilo of propofol, 140 milligrams. Their blood level peaks at around eight mics per ml. Two minutes later, it'll be four mics per ml. Two minutes after that, it'll be two mics per ml, and so on. That's what this is telling you. Everybody with me on that? The next column is the elimination half-life. That's the one that's going to tell you how long it takes to get the drug out of the body. The distribution half-life tells you how much, how long it takes to get into the body, into the, from the blood into the tissues just to read in, in, the elimination half-life is how long it takes to get out of the body. And that's called the beta half-life. Or, just in pharmacology, if they say the word half-life without saying alpha-beta, they just mean beta half-life. That's what we always talk about. Because the alpha half-life isn't that big a deal. You're worried about the beta half-life. It's normally expressed in hours. Look at diazepam. Alpha half-life is 10 to 15 minutes. But it takes a long time for it to kind of get out into the body, blood level to fall as it distributes. It's kind of a slow going into the body. So you'd expect the onset to be slower. Wouldn't you? I would. Now you would too. Okay, let's go to page 46. 46. Forty-six. 
All right, here's a little blurb I wrote up. Let me go through it. Bottom of page 46. Drug elimination. Elimination half-life, beta half-life. The elimination half-life is the time necessary for the plasma content of a drug to drop to half of its initial concentration. It takes the same amount of time for a drug's concentration to fall from 100 to 50 as it does to fall from 10 to 5. All right. Now, what that means is this. What I'm trying to say is this. Uh, for reasons we don't have to get into, maybe someday we will, <coughs> most drugs, all the, all the drugs that we cover, uh, follow what's called first order pharmacokinetics. Right? Don't write this down. <laughs> first order kinetics means the drug leaves the body at a constant rate. Rate is a percent, right? Rate means percent. A constant rate. So once you get, if I put 200 mic, mic blood level of a drug X into the bloodstream, it goes out at a constant rate. If I put 10 mics in the bloodstream, it goes out at a constant rate. A certain percent per hour will always be falling at the same rate. There's a lot of physiologic reasons why that happens. We don't have to worry about it. Just take my word for it. There's a couple of drugs that follow, don't follow that. They follow zero order kinetics. And that means you can only eliminate it a certain amount per hour, per hour. The classic one is, of course, the alcohol. Alcohol metabolism, if you take a lot of alcohol in, you can't get rid of it because you can only put out a certain amount per hour. So the more you drink, uh oh, your blood level goes high and you get a DUI because you can't eliminate it any faster. The other class of drug that everybody uses in examples is phenytoin, dilantin. Dilantin is a little difficult to dose. Pharmacists always come up with dose. They have a lot of formulas and little pocket apps on their, their phone, those nerd things, <laughs> so they can calculate what dose to give of dilantin because that follows zero order kinetics. But other than that, all the drugs certainly that we use follow first order, which means they go out at a constant rate. All right, now what that means is this, and that's all what I'm explaining in this paragraph. So go to the next page. This is the punchline. Here, here, this is the holy grail right here. Look at the table on the top of page 47. All right, here goes. You, you already know this. All right, if I give a drug, and let's say I fruit, well, as soon as I give it, Push it IV push, propofol 140 milligrams, I end up with a blood level of 8 mics per ml. I just showed you on that table or figure, right? All right, so at time zero, in other words, as soon as I give it, right, that second, how much drug have I eliminated? Well, none, because I just gave it, right? And how much drug is remaining? 100%. So we just started. All right, then one half life later, by definition, remember the half-life, the definition is the time it takes to fall by one half. So, one half-life later, how much drug have I eliminated? 50%. Why? Because it falls by one half. Right? Half is 50%. How much drug is gone? 50%. How much drug is still there? The other 50%. Right? You with me? Let's divide by two again. This is high math. <laughs> the second half-life, I eliminate half of this. Half of this 50%. So now I've eliminated 75%. Right? How much is left? 25%. Two half-lives. By the second half-life, the first half-life, you eliminate half, 50%. You got 50% remaining. The second half-life you eliminated by then 50% plus 25%, so that's 75%. You got 25% remaining, right? The third half-life, well, let's divide by two again. You got 25% left divided by two. I get rid of another 12 and a half milligrams or micrograms. So then I've, get, I've gotten rid of 87.5% of the drug, and I still have 
12 and a half percent left. Fourth half life, divided by two again, you're getting tired again. <laughs> Take that 12 and a half and divide it by two, and you got to end up with six point something, and you've gotten rid of 93.75% of the drug. Finally, the fifth half life. Divided by 2 again, 6.25 divided by 2 is 3.125. And how much have I gotten rid of? 96.875%. Now, mathematically, I can just keep doing this for the rest of your career. Divide by 2 and do an infinity. But in this, since this is drug elimination, in reality, once you've gotten rid of, I say, four half-lives, once you've gotten rid of 93% of the drug in the body, there's not going to be enough left to produce any effect. So basically, the pharmacists tend to use five half-lives. The clinicians, like, like us, tend to use four. But this brings me to a cardinal rule of pharmacokinetics. It takes four half-lives to eliminate any drug. About four half-lives, rounding it off, to eliminate any drug. Why? It's just mathematically true. Because the first half-life I got rid of 50%, second 75%, third 87.5, fourth 93.5 fractions. Has everybody seen that, why I got that? So the half-life of a drug, let's go back to the very beginning, is the time it takes for the blood level to fall by one half. And the beta half-life is the time it takes the blood level to fall by one half because the drug is being eliminated out of the body. That's why the drug level, blood level is falling. It's falling because you're peeing it out. It's falling because it's being metabolized in the liver, and then you're peeing out the metabolites or whatever. <clears throat> yes? Wouldn't potency affect that? No. Potency doesn't matter. It'll be a lower starting microgram level. If you have a more potent drug, instead of starting at... Uh, 8 mics per ml, maybe you're only starting at 2 mics per ml. Then you take it by one half, it'll be 1, half again will be 0.5, and so on. So it's always a constant rate. The first half life always is the same as the second, the third, the fourth. Okay. Well, that's half life. Now, let's go back to where we started, page 151. What's the elimination half-life of, I don't have one on uh, The elimina elimination half-life of sodium pentothal is 12 hours. That's a fact, I'll just tell you. I, I, I took it off the table. How long does it take to get pentothal out of the body? 48 hours. 48 hours, right. Because it's four times the half the elimination half-life of propofol in a healthy person is about one hour. <coughs> How long does it take to get rid of the propofol out of the body? Four hours. Which one would you rather give? Duh. <laughs> We're trying to get the patient awake, send them home, have them be safe, not have a hangover effect, not be drowsy the next day and be able to go to work, all the rest of that good stuff. Well, then I'd rather have a drug with a half-life of one hour than I would with a half-life of 12 hours. Look at diazepam. Half-life is 20 to 50 hours. That's a pretty good range. The pharmacists tend to always use 37 as the standard or the average. Average person, the half-life value was about 37 hours. So when I take one 10 milligram pill of Allium, how long does it take to get rid of the heart of the body? <coughs> well, four, uh, 37 is about a day and a half, right? And it takes four half-lives, so it takes about a week to get that volume out of the body, the one 10 milligram tab. That's long. That's ugly. Look at Versed. What's the half-life? Two hours. So they're both the same drugs, 
Benzodiazepines and benzodiazepine, they all do the same thing. They all work on the same receptor. The only difference, one main difference is their kinetics. And I can take Versed and get it out of the body eight hours. And I can take Valium and get it out of the body in a week. Which would I rather do? Well, we're looking for short, so I'd rather do the Versed. That makes sense? That's half-life. That's what the half-life of a drug is. Now, it doesn't isn't the same as duration of action. As I'm going to show you in a minute, the duration of action of a drug is different than the half-life. If somebody said, I've had people say to me, oh, what's the duration of action of such and such a drug? And they say, well, the half-life's eight hours. Well, that didn't answer the question. The half-life tells you how long it's been in the body. The duration tells you how much it's at the how long it's at the receptor actually do, doing something. And they can, not especially the same thing as you'll see in a minute. Okay. Now, the next column is clearance on page 151 again. And the clearance we're not even going to bother with. It's just a number they use for calculations, determining dose, determining dosing intervals. He can draw off levels when the pharmacist is trying to calculate um, antibiotics, uh, doses, and so on. The clearance, by definition, is how many mLs of blood per kilo of body weight is cleared of the drug per minute. How many mLs of blood per kilo of body weight per minute are cleared of the drug? And they give you a number and nobody cares and we're never going to look at it again. All right, the higher the clearance means the faster you pee it out. All right, the next one column is called volume of distribution. We're going to take a minute to talk about this. You will hear this term. It is have a little bit of clinical relevance. So let's talk about volume of distribution. The a pharmacist, or if more specifically a pharmacokineticist, looks at the body as a series of compartments, as you know in different areas in the body where you can get a drug to distribute into and so on and so forth. And so they look at the inside of the body as certain volumes. The blood, has, you have so much blood, that's going to be one compartment. You have so much muscle, you have so much fat. Remember Dr. Eggers thing about the vessel-rich group and the fat and the muscle? Well, that's, a, that's a looking at different volumes of, of inside the body. Now, what the kinetics people do, as far as fluid volumes in the body, is this. And I wrote it all out right underneath this table, and this is it, so let's do it. The theoretical compartments and volumes in the body, this is all made up, just ideal stuff, are envisioned as follows. Number one, the plasma compartment contains four liters. So you got four liters of plasma in the body an average person in an average situation. The interstitial fluid volume contains 10 liters. The extracellular fluid volume combines the plasma and the interstitial. You take those two and put them together. One was 4 and one was 10. So if you take 4 and 10, that's 14 liters. So the extracellular, outside the cells in the body, fluid volume is about 14 liters. The intracellular fluid volume is 28 liters. So total body water is equal to the plasma plus interstitial fluid plus intracellular fluid which is 28. If you add all those up you end up with 42 liters. That's 14 and 28. So what they're saying is the total body water is equal to 4 plus 10 plus 28. So an average person has 42 liters of fluid volume in their body. Watery spaces. Spaces are liquid. If you add everything up. Is everybody with me so far? So the typical VD, uh, capital V with a small d next to it, that's volume of distribution. 
normalized for body weight of 70 kilos, would be about 42 liters in a 70 kilo person, or about 0.6 liters per kilogram. And each kilo of our weight, about 0.6 of that kilo, is, is fluid. The volume distribution gives one the sense of how extensively a drug distributes throughout the body. A drug with a large VD, in other words, greater than 0.6, if 0.6 is the, no, the average, if your VD of this drug is higher than 0.6, what does it mean? Well, it's going in all the body water, but it must be going somewhere else too, because the number's high. Because you only got 0.6 of water, and the volume of distribution is three, it's going somewhere else besides water, right? Where's it going? In the tissue, probably, right? So, a drug with a large VD greater than 0.6 implies that it's widely distributed in the body and likely lipid soluble. So our drugs like propofol and whatever we give, they have higher VDs because they go in not only the body water, because we give them IV, but they also go into tissues and fat and everything else too. Right? A drug with a small VD, less than 0.4, is largely contained in the plasma and likely just water soluble can't get going to the tissues because it can't pass any barriers. It's too water soluble. It's too ionized. Now, some other factors such as the size of the drug, if it has a special carrier molecule, certain disease states and fluid shifts, for example, associated with burn injuries or pregnancy, makes it be expected to alter distribution volume. So let's look at the volume of distribution on the table above this. It's in liters per kilo. And normal volume of distribution is about 0.6. And look at our drugs. Propofol, 2 to 8. Oh, man. That's a large volume it's distributing into, right? They all tend to be a little bit high. So let me summarize. The volume of distribution number is an indicator of how widely a drug distributes in the body. The higher the number, the larger the volume it's going into in the body. Now, this is what you're going to read in a book. I'll just make an example. This lady's in the third trimester. She's coming for a C-section. You're going to give her sucks because she needs a general anesthetic. You need to do a rapid sequence because she's got a big, fat, uh, pregnant belly and she's susceptible to aspiration. And so you've got to give her a, a rapid sequence. And so you're going to use succinylcholine. And the book will say you should give a higher dose of succinylcholine because of the preg third trimester of pregnancy they have a higher volume of distribution. That's the statement they'll make. What they mean by that is, because of fluid shifts, because of the fetus in there, and all the different amniotic fluid and blah, 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 that third trimester pregnancy moms tend to have a bigger fluid volume than a non-pregnant average person. And because they have a bigger fluid volume, you better give them a higher dose, right? What they're saying is, if I take a bucket of water and I stick 100 milligrams of sucks in there, it's going to be a certain concentration in that bucket, right? If I take a bigger bucket of water and put 100 milligrams of sucks in there, it's going to be more diluted. It's not going to be as high as this high level. Therefore, I better give more so I get the same concentration. See what I'm saying? So that pregnant mom with a larger volume of distribution, what they're saying is, the inside of them, they got more water to uh, distribute a drug into, therefore you better raise the dose. So you read, you see this statement, it's in probably in my book, I'm sure it's in all the OB books, etc. Third trimester pregnant women have a higher volume of distribution. Therefore they require a higher dose, especially of water soluble drugs. Make sense?
All right, let's take a break. Okay, back to page 151. So I did distribution half-life, elimination half-life, clearance, the volume of distribution. If anybody has any issues with those, please let me know. The final column is protein binding, so let's talk a little bit about that. And so what, when they, they always give a protein binding um, uh, value for drugs and um, let's turn to page 155. All right, don't write, let me talk. Protein bank. Drug receptors are proteins. So when a drug binds to a receptor, it's binding to a protein. Enzymes, uh, cell embedded, uh, lipoproteins, whatever the receptor happens to be. Well, there's other proteins in the body that aren't drug receptors. The primary one being albumin. That's pretty much in all your tissues. That's the largest plasma and tissue protein we have, volume-wise. And actually, it's a fairly unique chemical uh, because it's able to bind to both positive and negative charges. It's called amphoteric in chemistry. So albumin is a very important uh, protein in the body. And a drug, uh, if it binds to albumin, then it's not binding to the receptor. And they were, they're both uh, attracting, uh, trying to attract the stereospecific drug, positive or negative charges, etc. So uh, I guess I'm rambling too much. It's simpler than that. Drugs bind to albumin. Right? And if they're bound to albumin, then they're not bound to the receptor. So you're, it's kind of lost to the equation, right? So if you have a drug that's highly bound to albumin, then a lot of it is not available to the receptor to produce the effect. Now, the drug company's got to figure all that out before they put it on the market. If you have a drug that's 99% bound in the body to albumin, they got to make the dose high enough so that 1% that isn't is still enough to produce a receptor effect. See what I'm saying? So if you look at protein binding table, I'm sorry, back to page 151, they list the table protein binding percent, and they give you numbers. Uh, for example, diazepam 98 percent, propofol 98 percent, ketamine 12 percent, and so on. And that's the percent that the drug is bound to not receptor proteins, but to plasma and tissue proteins, such as albumin, number one, and back to page 155. The other very important binding protein for drugs is called uh, alpha-2 acid glycoprotein. That's in the top of page 155. I wrote this all for you. Alpha-2 acid glycoprotein, or everybody just abbreviates it AAG. Now, what it comes down to then our drugs very, very frequently, almost always, have some albumin binding, usually acid drugs, and some binding to AAG, especially in disease states. AAG preferentially uh, uh, binds basic drugs. So, here's the way it works. All right. Here's the way the pharmacology teaches it. If a drug has 99% protein binding, say, for example, Diazepam, it's 98%, we'll say 99. That means 1% of the dose that you gave is free to go to the receptor and make you not anxious. Now what happens if you don't have the normal amount of plasma proteins? What happens if you have an albumin deficiency? You've seen all that, you're ICU nurses. How many times have you seen albumins be low? Lots, right? So somebody has an albumin deficiency, and instead of binding 99% of the drug like they're supposed to, they only bind 96% because they don't have as much albumin. 
So now instead of 1% of the drug being active, it caused a free concentration. Now 4% is free concentration. That's 400 times more. That's four times the dose. You just increased the dose of the drug four times in this patient, but you gave the same dose that you gave the other patient. How'd you do that? Magic. So plasma protein and tissue protein binding is theorized to have, possibly have significant <coughs> effects in certain patients who are de protein deficient. Take a look at my example. I wrote this little example on page 155. If a drug is 99% protein bound, 1% free, the free fraction is active. If you change it to 97 protein bound and 3% free, it increases the free concentration by a factor of 3 or 300%. Right? Now, let's take a look at my other. So that's, that's all, a big difference, right? patient can possibly get toxicity just even though you gave the same dose because of less protein binding. Now, four categories of patients are commonly cited. I wrote this right in bold for you right on this page. Every pharmacology book says these are the four groups of patients you need to worry about of possible differences in protein binding. Number one, somebody has got a nutritional problem, malnourished. All right, that's could be it's pretty catch-all term, but you know what it means. Somebody who's got uh, uh, deficiency in, in nutrition for whatever reason. Anybody with severe liver or kidney disease, because both of those patients will, or groups of patients, can be protein deficient and very frequently are protein deficient. Vegans. And vegans, yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Me. It's true though. <laughs> they, they don't get enough protein. They need to eat a steak. And the uh, last category is not a disease state, but it's the last trimester of pregnancy. In the last trimester of pregnancy, albumin levels tend to fall. And that's, that's normal for pregnant women. So the four categories of patients that any pharmacology book will flag as potential issues with protein binding of drugs is somebody who's malnourished for whatever reason, severe kidney and liver disease, and the last trimester of pregnancy. Okay, now, we're almost done. What happens if, is there a limit? I mean, is there a limit? In other words, if it's 99% protein bound and goes down to 97, that's a big difference. What if a drug is only 13% protein bound and it goes down to 10? Is that going to raise the level of the free fraction exorbitantly? And the answer is no. It's just a little tiny increase, right? Already, 87% of the drug was free, and now 89% or 90% is. And it's not a big difference. So it's not going to matter. So then the question is, hey, Johnny, What's the cutoff point? At what point does protein binding not matter anymore? And the answer is probably around 90%. If the drug is protein bound less than 90%, there's not enough protein binding for changes in the numbers to matter. If a drug is protein bound more than 90%, then yes, it can possibly matter. Okay, does that make sense? All right, one more thing. There's a um, there's a uh, another issue with protein binding, and that is uh, an issue of uh, drug interactions. And because this is what can happen. And the one that the drug they test in every pharmacology book ever made, I promise you, they do it all the time. Is Coumadin. Because Coumadin, of course, you have to make sure your levels are correct or you're going to get bleeding problems, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say you have, you're on Coumadin. Coumadin is 99% protein bound. Everybody knows that. 
world famous. And because you're on Coumadin, you're nervous. So your doctor prescribes Valium to make you not nervous for the fact that you're on Coumadin. <laughs> Valium is 99% protein bound. Well, you've only got a finite number of plasma proteins, right? You've only got so much albumin in you. And now you have two drugs competing for the same albumin sites of binding <coughs> sites. Who's going to win? Well, they're going to displace each other. Each drug is going to have less binding than it would have normally because they're, both of them are trying to get on the same site. So that's a drug interaction that's going to raise the blood level of Coumadin and it's going to raise the blood level of Valium by that interaction. So the second issue is not only in those categories of patients who are protein deficient, but the second issue is a potential drug interaction that can occur in patients taking more than one highly protein bound drug at the same time. When I'm driving the LA freeways, as you are also, and you hear a commercial for CVS pharmacy or Costco pharmacy or something, and they say, our pharmacists are able to talk to you about drug interactions and make sure you're safe and, you know, come here and buy our prescription here. And uh, well, they got a computer program that just spits out a little red flag that's, you know, flashing on the screen that goes, uh oh, two highly protein bound drugs, better talk to the patients. So, you know, it's not that, uh, that amazing. <laughs> they didn't memorize all these tables of drugs. But I love pharmacists, I'm not giving them a hard time. Um, so, <coughs> let me summarize it all. I'm done. Let's go back to the beginning. The reason they report protein binding of drugs in tables is because the, the old wives' tale of the fact that protein binding of drugs probably matters clinically for two reasons. One, if a drug is highly protein bound to either albumin or AAG, then the free fraction is the active fraction. Any decrease in the plasma proteins or tissue proteins for a disease reason such as malnutrition, severe liver or kidney disease, for the last trimester of pregnancy, it's not a disease but a condition, then uh, the chances are there can be a greater free fraction and the patient have, may have an exaggerated response. The second issue is, of course, if you're giving more than one highly protein bound drug at the same time, there can be comp competition for the finite number of binding sites on albumin and AEG, and therefore there can be a higher blood level of each drug. All right, that's, that's the way the story goes. All right, I'm sticking to it. Not really. Turn to page 44. Page 44. There's a little write-up of all the stuff I just talked about, and you can take a look at it. It's, it's, uh, it'll just say what I said, and um, uh, just let me briefly go through it on page 44. Changes in protein binding have long been theorized to influence the drugs of clinical effect. Two situations are commonly cited. The first involves a patient with reduced proteins, uh, and the other one is uh, when you give two or more highly protein bound drugs together. And again, you can read it, I just went through the whole thing. However, um, let's go to the next page, 45. Now, everybody who's ever taken a pharmacology 101 class, including you, including me, including every pharmacist in America, in the world, they all memorize this. Protein binding, this is what matters. Every pharmacology book you look in, they have a table and it always says protein binding, all right? And it's not true. So now you know it, and you can just not pay any attention to it. Here's why. Take a look at page 45. <coughs> page 45, second to last paragraph. Or third. No clinically relevant um, examples of changes in drug disposition or effects 
have been clearly dis ascribed to plasma protein binding. The idea that a drug displaced from plasma protein increases the unbound drug and the effect seems simple and obvious. Unfortunately, this simple theory, which is appropriate for a test tube, does not work in the body. Why? Because if the body, you have a more free fraction, the body just pees it out. The body just metabolizes it. It just, just, just redistributes it somewhere. <coughs> right? So it isn't so linear that, oh, now it's 2% free fraction. That's all going to be at the receptor. You just, you know, you're not at, at maximum capacity. You just get rid of it. So, the clinic, uh, finally, in my last comment, the clinical application of present protein binding is only to help interpret and measure drug concentrations. Um, so you can do calculations with it and so on, but is it clinically relevant? Probably not. And now you know it, you're going to tell it to your kids and your grandkids, and you're going to stick to the story of protein binding, no matter what, knowing all well that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to break from the crowd. All right, back to page 151. So that's the table. There's a standard pharmacokinetic table. I just wanted to go through what all these things mean. So you'll have them now for the rest of your life. You can look at it, what is distribution of half-life, the time it takes to go from the blood into the tissues, <coughs> elimination of half-life, the time it takes to get the drug out of the body, the clearance is clearing blood through the, of the drug in the kidneys, volume of distribution is the body water volume that the drug goes into, and protein binding is protein binding. Okay. All right, let's go to the next page and talk about protein. This is a very important figure, and this is going to be your everyday life. And so I'm going to go to page 152, and this is a world-renowned diagram on propofol kinetics, and we can go through this now by saying the following. You go to work in the morning, you grab your propofol, you draw it up, you're going to give your famous two milligrams per kilo, or if you're real daring, you might go to two and a half. <laughs> Big, healthy, athletic man or woman, you might want to give a little higher dose, but let's say two. So you figure out your 140 milligrams of propofol, you give them IV push, and here's what happens. This is time in seconds here, <clears throat> minutes, percent of the dose you gave, and so we don't show it going up, but let's say this is where it started, 100%. You gave it, IV. It took you five or ten seconds to push that plunger in. There you go. You got this blood level, right? Now watch. Blood level falls very rapidly. In fact, I would go down to here, maybe. Within about four minutes, there's almost none of it left in the blood. Where'd it go? It's still in the body somewhere, right? Well, let's take a look. Vessel rich group, vital organs, central compartment. Use whatever word you want. It peaks at about what? One minute. So it's leaving the blood and going off into the tissues. And the tissues it's going off into are, for the most part, your vital organs. Why? Because they get 75% of the cardiac output per minute. So the place it goes, the drug goes first, the fastest, is your heart, your kidneys, your lungs, your brain, of course, <coughs> where we want it to go, your thyroid, your liver, whatever, your vital organs. Here it is peaking. One minute. <coughs> so after a minute, it's already starting to fall out of the vital, leave the vital organs. All right. Now let's look at what you're doing. You gave it, oh, now you're taking your syringe and turning the stopcock or taking the needle out, putting it back on the top of the table. 
and you're reaching over there for your laryngoscope, and you're in the trachea tube, you're glancing at the monitors, uh, the patients lost their last reflex, now they know they're in stage three, that's about a minute's gone by, you're getting ready to intubate, right? Well, the patient's already waking up. Better hurry up. <laughs> Better hurry up. Well, the drug then is leaving the vital organs. And let's see, here's eight minutes. Let's say it's falling around this slow. There's not going to be much left of the brain, right? So by then, the patient's going to wake up. Because there's no more left in the brain, or very little left in the brain. Where did it go? Still in the body. It's only eight minutes after you gave it. It didn't get metabolized that fast. Where did it go? Well, it went into the muscles. That's the second largest group as far as drug distribution and mass, volume, speed of blood flow, etc. So let's say it's about 15 minutes has gone by, and most of that propofol you gave now is in the muscles. And the patient's awake. They're talking to you already. They started to wake up after 10 minutes. They're starting to open their eyes and looking around and responding to your, hey, Mary, take a deep breath, hey, George, move over, whatever. In 15 minutes, they're going to be pretty awake. All right. Then, as it falls out of the muscle, eventually, where does it end up? In the fat. Because it is fat soluble, and even though the fat doesn't give much blood flow, but if you give it enough time, it'll end up going into the fat. So, here's the bottom line. Memorize this. I'm going to ask you this in the next test. Every one of your preceptors for the rest of your career is going to ask you this. You're going to ask the next student when you work with them and you graduate. And you're going to try to trip them up with this same statement. But you won't be able to because I'm going to tell you the right answer. The reason somebody goes to sleep so quickly from a bolus of pentothal is because of rapid distribution from the blood into the brain. <coughs> and we knew that already, right? The reason somebody wakes up so quickly after a dose of propofol is rapid redistribution. That's the key word, redistribution. It redistributes from the brain off into peripheral tissue, muscle and fat. So when your preceptor says, well, why is the patient waking up after you gave him the propofol? You're going to say one word. The word is going to be Redistribution. So, I slug somebody with a sleep dose of propofol, 140 milligrams. They go to sleep in a matter of 15, 20 seconds. One arm to brain circulation time. In other words, how long it takes to go from my arm IV up into the brain. That's going to be 10, 15 seconds. They've got to rapidly go to sleep because of rapid distribution into the brain. They wake up about 8 to 10 minutes later because of rapid redistribution out of the brain, vital signs, or vital organs, into the other tissues, muscle and fat. The half-life of propofol is about an hour. The total time propofol is in the body is about four hours. a long way to get to that state. Hour and a half. Say it again. A sleep dose of propofol, the onset will be around 10 to 15 seconds. The duration will be about 8 to 10 minutes. The half-life is about an hour. And the total time it's in the body is about 4 hours. Everybody see why now? Now you're going to know what happens to propofol when you give it to somebody. Now, I go to intubate. 
Oh, I couldn't get the tube in. For whatever reason. It's going to happen. It happens everywhere. Let it go. Come out. Ventilate a little bit. Get some more air in there. And then do what? Maybe give some more propofol. Because by the time you go in for that second intubation, maybe the blood level's here. You better slug them with another 50, 100 milligrams to get you through that second attempt. It's going to happen, and it happens to all of us. And less so the more you experience you get, but nonetheless, it does happen. That's why people will recommend you give a second, you know, maintenance dose or smaller dose. And uh, so the patient's not awake when you uh, go in to innovate. Now, let's take a look at page 153. I had a buddy of mine, Steve Beaton, who draw these, he's an artist. I was trying to show what redistribution looks like. And I don't know how successful it was. I think it was. <laughs> but it's in color in the textbook, so the little dots are green. But not here they're not. All right, just follow my pen. All right, you got it right in front of you, you don't have to write it. Here I see I got a little syringe. You drew a little syringe in the patient's arm, and you're injecting propofol here. So what happens? Well, first of all, it goes up into the heart. The heart starts distributing it to the vital organs. And so the, in the beginning, because the brain gets so much cardiac output, the majority of the propofol is going to be up in the upper body. It's going to be in your brain and up on top of your chest. It's just for human physiology. It isn't special to propofol. It's any bolus drug you give. Right? However, as time passes, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, the drug starts to distribute more. And you'll see, I'm trying to make these more dilute. See, this is more concentrated, more dilute, more dilute. And finally, down here, it's more evenly distributed throughout the body. <coughs> this is going to be about eight minutes later. So you went to sleep quickly because most of the drug went to your brain first. That's a uh, rapid distribution. But you wake up eventually because of rapid redistribution. And that's what I'm trying to show. Eventually, the drug is going to distribute all throughout the body. Less is going to be in the brain. And you're going to wake up from that. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. On the graph, you, you, oh, or you mentioned that the onset is 10 to 15 seconds. If you go to the graph, it corresponds with 30 to 40 percent of the vital organs. Is that correct? The previous? Previous. Page. Yeah, let me take a look. Yeah, what will happen is um, you're going to go to sleep probably when it gets to about here. So you don't have to have the peak for you to be asleep. You're going to be asleep once it's, it starts going in right about here. And then usually, interestingly, you wake up when it actually is higher. You wake up at about there. Is that, is that what you're at? Yes. Your question? Yes, thank you. OK, cool. Let's look at these. Page 154. Again, we looked at this already, so I kind of drew on it. But the top, this is 2 milligrams per kilo, propofol, plasma concentration. And you see that this is the therapeutic range. We already know what that is, don't we? This and this. The patient's going to be asleep as long as the blood level is somewhere between those two points. So the patient goes to sleep somewhere in here. And then you see around eight minutes later, the blood level falls below the therapeutic range, and the patient wakes up. See that? Take a look at this bottom one. These are different doses. So these are simulations of propofol 
I'll read, I'm reading the legend. In response to Bowles doses ranging from 1 to 2.5 milligrams per kilo on a 70 kilo patient. So he gave 1 milligram, 1.5 uh, to 2.5. This vertical axis is on a log scale. So probability of loss of consciousness, responsiveness, OK? So this is one milligram per kilo. How long is this patient going to be asleep? They're going to be asleep right here, this long. That's too low a dose, right? You've got to be a real fast innovator to do that. This is two and a half milligrams per kilo. How long is that patient going to be asleep? This long. That's a little better. Gives me closer to 10 minutes to get my job done. Get the gas out and start cranking it in. Did you see that? Questions? Now, you tell me that, same thing. Ketamine, same thing. All the induction drugs. Presidex, dexamethasone, same thing. So on my next test, when you see the word redistribution, I would circle it. I would say yes. Hey, good answer. <laughs> Thanks for suggesting that. <laughs> that would be a clue. why people wake up so quickly from our inductions. Because we give them bolus, the body is the body the way the blood flow is, and that's why it's good. It isn't because they're metabolized real fast. It isn't because they're peed out real fast. It's because they're redistributed. And that's the point. Okay? All right, next. I want to, uh, let's go to the uh, my next point here and that is how do they work this is the next page 156 so let's stop in a minute and talk about this the induction drugs work by a mechanism referred to as GABA mimetic GABA is GABA gamma amino butyric acid it's the largest volume of inhibitory transmitter in the brain, makes inhibitory impulses and messages and blah, whatever. Um, are you dropping and rolling? <laughs> oh, all right. You can come sit down if you want. You don't have to eat uh, standing up. Um, so uh, GABA is the number one inhibitory transmitter in the brain. And um, the function was discovered with the benzodiazepines. In fact, we didn't even know it was GABA when we knew it was Valium. And they used to call it the benzodiazepine receptor without even knowing that it was actually a GABA receptor. That came later. So obviously the benzodiazepines work here, and we found out subsequently that many of the inhibitory drugs in the brain, because this is the main inhibitory chemical, mimic it, and that's how they produce their inhibition. Now if you take a look at the GABA receptor on page 156, you'll see there's, well, let me go on the camera and point. Why not? Here's a GABA receptor. And it's a protein embedded in the cell membrane and has different binding sites. And if you look at it from the top down, uh, when it's activated, it looks like a donut hole. 
because there's a hole in the top when you open the receptor up. And what happens is it controls the amount of chloride that goes into a cell. So see they have Cl here. And when you activate, when GABA attaches to a GABA receptor, its own receptor, it causes it to open. And chloride flows inside the cell from out to in. Chloride's negative. So the cell becomes more negative inside. The term for that is hyperpolarized. So if you have to, uh, to get an action potential to occur in that cell, it has to reach a potential of, say, minus 45 before it fires. Resting potential is minus 80 or 90, let's pretend. Now the resting potential, because you put all that chloride in there, is more negative, it's hyperpolarized, and now its resting potential is 110 or 120, minus 110 or 120. So you got to go from minus 120 to minus 45, instead of going from minus 90 to minus 45. That's a bigger distance, right? You need a stronger stimulus. It's going to take more activation. So the cell is going to be inhibited, harder to fire, because it's going to take uh, more energy to get it to move to its threshold or firing potential. Everybody with me on that? So the reason GABA is inhibitory, the, what the books would say is, GABA increases the chloride conductance, hyperpolarizes the neurons, makes some inhibited. That would be the science lingo. Now, also on this GABA receptor you'll see there's a separate binding state here for benzodiazepines. There's a separate binding here for propofol, etomidate, and the barbs, pentothal, brevetol, whatever. There's, they don't show it, but there's a separate one for the inhalation anesthetics. Des, Sivo, and Isom. And there's other things as well. Alcohol, some other things. So there's many different substances that can influence the body's own chemical that happens to be gamma, all of which increases chloride conductance, makes the cell more negative or hyperpolarizes it, and makes it more difficult to fire. And that's how they produce inhibition. Make sense? Now, there's an exception. Last time when we talked about the gases for the next couple of weeks, last couple of weeks, <coughs> I kept saying all the anesthetics do this, what did I always say, except nitrous oxide, right? Well, you're going to hear the same kind of thing when we talk about the induction drugs. Because we're going to go through this and go, all the induction drugs do the same thing, except ketamine. Ketamine is always the exception, for reasons we'll get into. So ketamine is the exception. All the other drugs work on GABA receptors or GABA mimetic. Ketamine is the exception. And ketamine works on what's called an NMDA receptor. That's right here. That's N-methyl D-aspartate. Aspartate is amino acid. It's an amino acid receptor in the brain. And these are excitatory receptors. They respond to amino acids and pr produce excitation. In fact, the primary amino acid that these receptors respond to is glutamate. So just like chlorine is the ultimate purveyor of the actions of GABA, Glutamate is the body's neurotransmitter for the actions of NMDA receptors. Glutamate is stimulatory. Ketamine blocks that. It's an inhibitor. It's an antagonist. So the mechanism of action of ketamine is it's an antagonist against glutamate at NMDA receptors. If you block an excitatory receptor, you get inhibition. Make sense?
There's other things that can affect it. You see there's ketamine. They're showing it binding to the NMD receptor and producing inhibition. On the next page, I just kind of do it a different drawing by a different artist. This is page 157, and this person is showing a GABA receptor. There's chloride going down the pore channel, going to the inside. There's GABA, and the benzodiazepines that work here also would be propofol and all the rest. So they're showing you the top, like a top down look. And there's the chloride channel in the middle there. Like a dog. So, as I always like to do, let's summarize page 158. Page 158. How do the induction drugs work? The next time your preceptor asks you that, when you're standing there trying to put something to sleep, you can say, don't bother me, I'm trying to put something to sleep. <laughs> After they'll call me up and have you in my office pretty soon. <coughs> All right, benzodiazepines work because they're gabamimetic. I'm on page 158. So it's propofol, so it's etomidate. Ketamine acts via an NMD receptor antagonism. Some books call it a glutamate receptor. Blocks it. All right, and then finally, dexmedetomidine or Presidex is an alpha-2 receptor agonist, sympatholytic drug, and I'm kind of running out of time to show you that, so I'll show you that first thing in the morning. Uh, and uh, why don't we call it quits for today? Any questions? Yes? Um, ketamine is a stimulant, right? Ketamine inhibits, excites, it's not a stimulant. It blocks excitatory responses. But by doing that, it causes hallucinations and stimulation in other areas. When you block one area, another area can predominate. That's why you see stimulation. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. See you tomorrow.